Hey guys, Kate Bigway here. Um, this is part of our Six Figure Freelancers Expert Series, and I am here today with Zafira Rajan, who is a communication specialist for high impact brands. She works a lot with brands that really create behavioral impacts and you know help people make changes, which is pretty cool. Um, I met Zafira at uh, the Italian Fix, I believe. I believe we met in Italy, um, learning a little bit more about copywriting. And I've come to really respect this woman and her copywriting skills. And um, Zafira, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit and just talk a little bit about how you became a freelancer or how you came to run your own business? Sure. Okay. Um, so I started freelancing about three years ago, part-time on the side of my desk, as I'm sure many people start doing. Um, I never anticipated that I would end up running my own business a few years from then, but um, the second I started taking on work, which for me at the time was like writing articles or blog posts or managing the odd social media account here and there. Um, one client was happy and then referred me to another client. And before I knew it, I just got a whole ton of referrals and was in a space to really consider it as something that I might want to do. Um, so I started scaling back from my full-time job. I was still I was working at a university in a marketing and communications role. Okay. And I scaled it back to a 50% commitment. So I could take a year to use the other 50% of my time to actually build myself up financially and strategically in a place where I could launch full-time um, the following year. And that's what I did last January. And I can safely say I never want to go back to Cuba again. Right? It's amazing. And I love that. I love that you, you know, basically just made your side hustle um, a full-time thing. And, and how did you go about negotiating that with your employer to get 50%? Was that an easy um, communication to, to drop, cut your hours? Because I think that's a genius move if that's possible for people. Well, it kind of happened to be a stroke of really good luck and fate. I was in another position at the university and was looking to hop into another role where a 50% position for a one-year contract literally dropped into my lap. And I think it was fate just telling me, yeah, this is what you need to do to get to the next level. So that was how it ended up working out. Um, but I do think it's worth a conversation with your employer at least to start cutting back, even if it's to 80%. Um, which I have encouraged others to do and they have followed through on it because it's just so hard to make time to work on your own stuff and any any amount of hours you can squeeze in to work on it if you're really committed will make an impact. Absolutely. And I think it's um, it's often we have this all or nothing mentality, right? You're either in business for yourself or you're in, in business for somebody else. And when you're early on, it's actually a much smarter move to have some stable income while you build out your systems. Um, I've never done that. I do things the hard way. It's my specialty. Um, so I usually just like go full force into freelance. But um, it's really nice to have that side hustle and that stability because you, it takes away that fear, right? Of, well, how am I going to pay my rent this month? So you're no longer scrambling and making bad decisions. You're able to make better decisions. So I think that's super clever. So thinking back to where you were when you first started freelancing, like what were some of the first steps that you did in order to, you know, set up your brand or find clients? Like how did you really get started with the business? What was that piece for you? Um, I think a lot of it was like applying to a lot of cold leads, um, setting up on cold leads. Um, I definitely had some Upwork gigs from the beginning to get me going, uh, which actually ended up transitioning into some full, like regular retainer clients, which I never expected. Um, I was always on the lookout for someone who needed help with something that was a service I was interested in offering. So. Over the last few years, that's been things like social media. It's been communication strategy. And I was very junior level when I started. Probably wasn't charging enough. But by taking on lots of different kinds of work in the realms that I wanted to work in, was just also experience enough on what it's like to manage a client, you know, what it's like right. to know your worth, um, how much do you charge for certain things. So... I was just really dedicated to following up on people who I think would have worked for me. Um, I also was volunteering with a nonprofit that I now lead communications for. 
um, that organizes networking events in our city and happened to be the perfect space for me to get out there. So I highly recommend doing that. I found a lot of clients through just simply volunteering and being on a committee of really engaged, connected people. Um, and that was something that didn't take a lot of effort on my end. So yeah, it was kind of like a mix of lots of, a blend of a lot of different things. But I would say like, I definitely worked really hard, whether it was finding, you know, postings online or just talking to people and finding out what they were looking for and if I could help in any way. Um, and it kind of just all took off from there. I love it. I did a lot of volunteering as well. And I'm a big proponent of that. You know, when you're early on, we tend to think like we have to be job hunting and really business is about relationship building. And I got, you know, when I moved to Savannah, Georgia, so I moved across country and, you know, didn't have, I didn't know a single person in Savannah, Georgia when I moved there. And how I started getting clients locally was I just volunteered. I wasn't lurking for clients. I just got involved in the community. And um, so it's a great way to start meeting people. And I love that so, so much. Um, so what, thinking back again to like taking that first leap, I know for me, I always waited too long in my day job. I was like so burnt out that I just had to get out of there. Um, but what were kind of <clears throat> the steps that you needed to take to get mentally prepared to run your own business? Or what was the catalyst for you that was like, I want to do this? Where did that inspiration come from? And well, I think I, I mean, I was, quite young, I was right out of university basically in my first job when I realized that I don't think I can do this forever. Um, and I just, I didn't love clocking in and out. I didn't like, you know, especially when three o'clock hit and I basically finished everything I needed to do that day, but I need to hang around for two hours because you can't really go home until then. And I realized that, you know what, I am really productive. I'm really efficient. I'm good at what I do. And to feel boxed into just one space where you have to do the same things over and over again, and you have to spend a lot of time waiting on things. You waste a lot of time in an office. You really do. I mean, I love coffee breaks, but there's just too many in a day sometimes. Yeah. And I just, you know, I'm definitely someone who loves to use time productively, and I figured that out really, really fast. So yeah. I think the catalyst for me was when. I actually just started getting this stuff on the side and I was like, oh my gosh, if I just had like a few more hours in a day, I could just do so much more, you know, mm -hmm. and especially when I realized how cyclical office um, life is, you know, I don't want to be running the same campaign every year right? Or <laughs> for the rest of my life, you know, I just, I need things to keep me on my feet. I need to feel challenged. Um, I need to feel out of my comfort zone. And I could see very quickly in terms of the people around me, the environment I was in, or just even watching people who, you know, were more advanced than I was in their career, just being very cushy. And wow. as soon as I picked that up, I was like, you know what, I would love the pension and I would love the benefits, but I'm young right now. I've got the energy, I've got the drive. I'm super productive. I'm just going to do this, you know, and mm -hmm. I'm a really positive person and I think you need that going into this. Otherwise you're yeah. just going to set yourself up for failure. <laughs> but I always just went into it thinking like, what's the worst that could happen? I'll just get a full-time job if this doesn't work out. Um, mm. And here we are, you know, but definitely for me, it's just the time management. And now what I love the most about being a freelancer is managing my own time and I doing what I want when I want. So I love that too. I, I have a client and when I was first talking with him, I thought he was really after the location independence when we first started talking. And then it was really, it wasn't so much that it was just the ability to make your own schedule, right? It's not so much that I have a problem working hard or working in an office. It's just like, why do I have to do it from nine to five? Like I'm really productive at like 7 PM to 9 PM. And so why shouldn't I take the afternoon or go to the pool and then come back and do my, my work at the night. So I love that idea of just, you know, being able to flex your, your hours. And you make yeah. your own rules, right? Isn't that amazing? <laughs> I think one of the other things that I realized um, was, you know, I am an introvert. 
And I do think freelancing is a great path to choose if you're an introvert, <laughs> because the other thing about office life is that I felt like it really drained me kind of taking a lot more sick days, you know, and yeah, you know, since I started freelancing, I've like barely been sick at all. So there's something there too. So I, I think it, it really depends on your personality and your attitude and your drive. But if you've got that combination of things, that's a good fit for freelancing. Just you need to just go for it. Yeah, I love that. I'm an introvert too. And I've been thinking more and more about that. If what like the what the connection is between introversion and extroversion and business um, because I think there are challenges to both I think a lot of extroverts are afraid of freelancing because they're afraid of being alone at home whereas like to me that's a selling point <laughs> like, <Yeah. it's, laughs> right like I love people it's not that I don't like people as an introvert but going into an office like you said it was so draining for me and those hallway meetings that would just take up half of your day. It's like, I literally, when I was in a corporate office, like four hours of my day was just hallway meetings and, you know, coffees, and it was just wasted time. Um, and it's so amazing. It's like, if you really look at where your time is going, like if you spent the same amount of time that you're actually in an office working, you'd be very successful as a freelancer. <laughs> And not telling eight people what you did last weekend. Right. <laughs> right. It's so interesting, that <laughs> dynamic. So, um, but for the extroverts out there that, you know, do kind of have that fear of um, being at home or whatever, do you feel like you need to go out of your way to make social connections outside of the office? Like, how do you find that balance between not having um, – a network, a built-in network through your career versus um, the office? That's a great question. And I do think that even though I am introverted, it's something I struggle with. And I think a lot of freelancers do. One of the things they started doing last year was join a co-working space. And that way, when I want the people time, I can just go get it. <laughs> and um, I try to schedule things like, you know, whether it's like a yoga class or a fitness class or something or a coffee with a friend every other day it's just one thing but that makes sure I get out of the house I meet someone I talk to someone and I'm much better with people one-on-one -on -one than I am in a large crowd anyways so to me that's valuable people time so it's definitely much more of an effort you will find that you do become a better friend to people because you know you your time is at your disposal and you can spend it with whoever you want who are the, the people who are important to you. So I find that, you know, my circle is very small, but it's really strong. And I don't think it would have gotten that strong if I hadn't been freelancing because I'd always be tired or busy, you right. know? So I think you definitely do have to seek out those opportunities, but in a way that's meaningful to you and that's healthy for you. For me, these are just the things that, that work for me. Um, if you're extroverted and you need to like, be in a large crowd of people or you need to like hang out with a big group of friends you might have to be the organizer of those things if you want to freelance or you know attend more networking events i do think co-working spaces are a huge huge thing that you know every freelancer should try um and at the space i go to i go on once a week but there are people there who are definitely extroverted and they're there every day and they love it you know so wherever you find, you, wherever you think you'll find a sense of community, I think you have to just start looking to those options and give it a try. I don't see a lot of extroverted freelancers working from home full time. It's right. very rare, you know, or extroverts who do start freelancing tend to fall into work that requires a lot of client face-to-face -face time right. and they enjoy that. So it's totally up to you. So great. So many great little pieces in there because I think it's really important to start the bit like this is one of the things that I teach a lot with my one-on-one -on -one clients is like making sure you're running the right business for you not the business that you think you should run and um and I think that's really common with a lot of people is like well everybody says I have to do x y or z or I'm not going to be successful and it's not true there are a million ways to build a business and you can do it in a manner that's authentic to you so I think there's some really good tips in there around kind of knowing what you need and figuring out the community 
Um, but what I want to actually expand on a little more is the co-working because I get this question a lot actually, and I don't know why I've not really talked about it. I just, I just don't find it all that interesting anymore because I travel full time. Um, but how do you kind of deal with working when you don't have a, a, I mean, you have a home office, but like, do you have some tips for working in cafes, working in co-working space or, you know, staying focused, that sort of things? Um, I think if you're going to leave the house to work, it should be the kind of work you can do in a slightly distracted environment. You know, so I think you have to be really conscious about what you're going to do if you're going to leave the environment you're usually very productive in. So, for example, I found that I can just really crank out blog posts now only in a coffee shop. And I've somehow just trained my brain that that's what I can do. <laughs> you know, go to a co-working space for a full day that tends to be a lot of maybe admin work for me. Okay. Um, and that way it's just like, it's working on my business stuff. If I'm gonna be in calls throughout the day, I tend not to leave the home office at all because it's just not professional to be in a space where there's lots of noise and chatter. You don't know what the Wi-Fi connection is gonna be. Yep. So I would say what's a really determining factor for me in terms of getting out of the house is the kind of work I wanna get done. And can I do it in these spaces? Um, when it comes to working in coffee shops, I find also going with a freelancer friend is really nice, especially mm -hmm. if you work on stuff that's not going to be interrupted by calls and you can bounce ideas off of each other. Because that is the one thing I definitely miss the most about being in an office is being able to bounce ideas off of someone. Um, you know, when you're working on something like a communication strategy all by yourself, you're like, I think this sounds pretty good, you know, but you yeah. just don't know until you hand off to the client. So sometimes yeah. it's nice to have someone around who you're comfortable talking to. Sometimes in a co-working space, you might feel like you're interrupting others. Yeah. Um, then I start chatting. So that's a good, good, um, a good time to go to a coffee shop. So, I love it. Yeah. And I, you don't have to go and park yourself somewhere for the full day. You know, one of the benefits of being a freelancer is knowing your productive times, like you said. Yeah. For me, it's like nine to 12 and then three to six, you know, so sometimes mm -hmm. I just need an afternoon to crank out some coffee or I need the morning and I like to change up my workspaces throughout the day if I can. So yeah, play to your productivity and just know what you need to get done and where you're going to thrive and you're really going to find out by experimenting. Absolutely. Such great tips there. Um, I'm, I'm very similar myself. Uh, I often will start working from home and kind of do the most critical thing first thing in the morning. And then it's like, I got to take a break. I'm going to go for a walk and I'll see where I end up. Um, you know, end up in a coffee shop, sometimes a co-working space. And I think it's, it's part of the fun for me. Um, you know, going back to kind of where we started at the beginning, I think I get so bored when I do the same thing over and over again. Yeah. Um, so I just love being able to have that variety is so nice um, so let's talk a little bit more about what specifically um, you do so you work with high-impact brands like how did that come about that you were able to focus down onto these brands where did that because um, I know you, when you started you were kind of not really sure exactly what you were doing so how did you refine your market over the years I think you know, like I said in the beginning, it was dabbling in all the different pockets. And, you know, once they found this pocket that I really enjoyed, which is helping, you know, my clients make a positive impact on their customers or their audience, um, the referrals also started coming from within that pocket and that pool. And I was doing really good work for them. They liked it and they shared it with other people. And, you know, that's how I ended up getting a lot of campaigns under my belt, a lot of projects, a lot of strategies. So it ended up with the dab, it started with the dabbling and then it started getting narrower and narrower. And, you know, I was still working with clients that I wasn't entirely sure were a good fit, but I was also operating under the fear of the first year, like I'm not gonna make it, I'm not gonna have enough money. And mm -hmm. I was still working with clients that you know, now I, I'm no longer working with because I realized that I can move in this direction, work with ones that uh, really resonate with me and that I just do better work for. So yeah, I think it takes some experimenting, some trial and error, you know, next year I might change it up and work with uh, a different, you know, industry or in different types of copy. And that's kind of the beauty of what we do. 
you know, right. so you have that possibility to experiment. Right now, this is what's working for me. It's really lighting me up. I love doing this kind of work. Um, and there's always the fear also when you start niching that you'll get bored again, you know, but so far to date, I think with the clients I'm working with, they all just make positive impacts in so many different ways. And that's really satisfying for me. So, ah. Yeah. I love that. And I love what you said about you do better work for them because you right. enjoy it more. And I think that's really important. I think it's something we miss a lot. Um, in general, it's like if you're enjoying the type of work or the type of client that you work with, you're going to get better results. Your client's going to be happier. They're going to come back and they're going to tell more people. So it like do what you love. You know, when it comes to working with clients, you want to really focus on the clients that you want, not the clients you think you should have, right? Um, and so all to do lists that you know, like what was at the bottom of it? What did I keep like procrastinating on getting to last? Was a sign that okay, you know what? Maybe this is just not a good fit anymore. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good one. Like if it's something that you just keep putting off, it's probably not something you want to do. So there's two reasons. It, it, let's see what you think. Maybe you have a, a different theory. But I believe that there are two primary reasons that we procrastinate. Um, one is just fear, or, or actually three. So one is fear. We really are just terrified of doing the task, and so we just find a reason not to do it. Then we've got it's too big. We don't actually understand what the task is, so we need to break it down. And then the third is that we really just literally don't want to do it and, and don't believe that we should do it for whatever reason. And it's only a task item because either we've committed to the wrong things <laughs> um, or somebody told us we should do things. Do you think that's great for you? Yeah. yeah, I think that's great. Um, the only other thing I would add, and this is just the kind of worker I am sometimes, is that some people just work better under pressure. I do with certain tasks. You know, I could have a piece of copy due in two weeks, but I'll think about it very hard for those two weeks, but I will wait until maybe a few days before it to start actually putting it down. So, but I just, I need deadlines and, you know, that's why I'm good at delivering on deadlines and not just like, you know, dates that are just not defined. So, yeah, I think it depends on the kind of worker you are, but the other three reasons, 100%. You know, yeah. sometimes it's just too big to tackle. Like, I've got something huge and I just need to start it. Just need to start it. That's all. Yeah. Sometimes it'll take me forever. You know, but once you do, you're like, okay, I got this. You yeah. Know, the things always seem too big or like you've taken on too much until you get in the middle of it. And you're like, yeah, this is why I do what I do. You know, but <laughs> it does take some procrastination, not going to lie. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm the same way. I think everybody is to a certain extent. And I learned a couple of years ago um, to just kind of embrace it as part of the process. And it made it much more enjoyable. Like 10 years ago, I would beat myself up over procrastinating. Like, why don't you just do this stuff instead of waiting to the last minute? And then I realized like it was part of the process. Also, tasks expand to the time that you give them. And if you give something two weeks, it'll take two weeks. If you give something two days, it'll take two days. Um, it's kind of magical. So if you just learn to embrace the, pro you know, <laughs> the procrastination and make sure that you do have those deadlines set and, and make them realistic, you know, you can enjoy your life and procrastinate. <laughs> yeah. Believe in the work that you do and you know it's good. It might take you two weeks or it might take you two days. Yes. To get there, you know, but if you know you're going to get there eventually, it's okay. You know, I find that I again, doing good work doesn't come when I'm forcing myself to do it. You know? I love it. Um, what are kind of, do you have any daily habits that you would say are critical for your success that you could share? I would say for like, there are a lot of things I do for my well-being that have like lended themselves to success. So it might sound funny, but one of the best things I ever did last year was adopt a dog. You know, I think for a freelancer, that's a really good thing because it means I get out of the house a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I usually start my day with like a nice long walk with my dog, which is nice to get that morning air or a morning workout, which never used to do, but now I am a fan of. Mm -hmm. um, and I find that when I'm doing these things, it's just giving, giving my brain space to breathe. And mm -hmm. it's 
I'm not a fan of rolling over in the morning and checking my email because it just ruins everything for the whole day. And that's how I come up with so many great ideas. It's just my morning time. You know, I'll come home, make breakfast, have a cup of tea, meditate, and then tackle, like start putting a to-do list together. So my morning routine is really critical to like how the rest of the day is going to go. If one of those things doesn't happen, it's, I'm just really thrown off. Um, in terms of just like success in general, I find that like learning how to run a business efficiently every day is a whole other job aside from what your job is. And so they've had to be like daily things that I implement where it's like, you know, keeping on track of like my accounting or my invoicing um, and things like that to just, you know, remember that you're running a business and it's just, you have to get paid and you have to know what you're doing. So those things are really important to me. Um, other than that, I think definitely like changing up my workspace, like we talked about is really important to me. Um, I like to break up my day by, you know, by project or by client. So like working in bursts works really well. Exactly. So yeah, there's like a whole bunch of little things, but like probably a year ago, I hadn't gotten to this point where I, I understood myself and my working process this well. Um, but now that I know what works for me, don't try to force things into pockets of time that just aren't going to work anymore. I love it. So many good tips in there. I don't even know where to start. So um, we'll, we'll start wrapping this up. But before we do, so with all of that in mind and, you know, thinking back to where you were a year ago, what do you think is the most important thing that you've learned in the last year that you wish you had known? Um, I would say that the fear of, like, fear of, um, being held back or just the fear of jumping into something, it's never really as bad as you think it's going to be. And there's always a solution. And, you know, if I had known earlier that I would just end up being really good at doing this, I would have just started doing this right away. Um, I think, yeah. So it's important to get out of your comfort zone. If you feel really cushy, get out of it. Make sure that you're feeling challenged. And I, I wish that like someone had told me that a long time ago and to just not be scared and do it. I'm definitely someone who was like, I need the financial stability. And I know that's a huge thing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people who know me were really, really surprised when I started freelancing. They were just like, really you, you know, <laughs> you have a budget like every month. I'm like, yeah, I know, but I'm just going to do this, you know? So take the plunge. It's just, it's not going to be as bad as you think it is. There'll be some ups and downs but you'll get through it. And if it's something you've been thinking about for this long, that's just a sign. So just um, go for it. <laughs> yeah, pull the trigger because it is, it's, it's absolutely worth it. Even when there are ups and downs and you know, that's, that's what I'm trying to do with six figure freelancers really is kind of alleviate some of that fear because yeah, I wasted so many years focusing on the wrong things or, you know, having that fear of a paycheck keep me in a job that really just destroyed my happiness. <laughs> Not. your happiness isn't worth it you can make money and be a creative business owner so thank you so much for that what is um what's next for you and your business so you've you've gotten some success what's next on your roadmap i think what's next is definitely um creating some products that's something i want to work on over the next year and i'm changing up my service packages um to kind of just offer my clients um, a bit more and to, like in buckets that make more sense for them. Um, so like I said, I was doing things like social media and blogging and stuff. And now I'm kind of moving forward in more like strategic direction um, and offering my clients sort of more high level strategic services. So yeah, I'm working on kind of packaging all those up nicely with a bow soon. Love it. Um, pulling out some new services, uh, testing new things. You know, constantly experimenting is the state of being a freelancer, and I'm really enjoying it. So, yeah, Good. I'm looking forward to offering more. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Zafira. And if somebody wants to get in touch with you, um, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, definitely by just going to my website and um, hitting that contact button or through my email, which is right on there, too. 
um, you can also find me on Instagram or LinkedIn. Awesome. I'll be sure to include those links um, with the video. And just thank you so much. You are such a pleasure, pleasure to talk to and so many great tips in this. I can't wait to, to start sharing this with the world. Awesome. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Safira.